Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. And over the past few weeks, I've been working on solving one of the biggest problems I see online when it comes to astrophotography, and that's narrowband image processing. It's the one thing that I see stopping one-shot color users from going into monochrome. And for folks that are already using a monochrome camera, the biggest complaint that I see in terms of how to get the best results possible. Now, if you go online, you'll get a million different answers to this, and there is no right answer, but this is what's been working for me and allowed me to get some of the best images I have to date and so I wanted to share it with you. If you want a copy of the guide that I'm gonna use, please email the one that's in the description and I'll get it out to you as soon as I can. And today we're gonna to go over it for folks that already have it so that we can go step by step to get the best results that you guys ever have or to allow you to overcome the fear of jumping into monochrome in general. So stay tuned. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and hop into the guide. And since I created a guide and all the feedback I get from you guys is how much you like the efficiency of my tutorials, I have screenshots for every step. So I'm gonna go through and explain that way. That way we can keep this short. My goal is not really to go over the artistic part of this because I can't tell you how to do that to your preference. My goal is to get us to that point. And then when we get to the hues and curves and things like that, that's where you can really play around in the sandbox and get the look that you specifically like. This is more of a framework. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. I'll, I'll go ahead and magnify it here. Now for dynamic crop, usually what I do is I pick the worst looking image in terms of stacking artifacts around the outside. And then I go ahead and just select the whole thing and I'll bump it in on each of the four sides. And then I drag the triangle to the other two images if we're doing an SHO example like this with the wizard nebula. And then on the third image that I started with, I'll hit the check mark and then all three will have the exact same crop. That way they'll line up perfectly. The next thing I do is dynamic background extraction. Now I saw that there were some feedback on the settings I used in my past video. I tried these and there was absolutely no difference. I'll overlay that, but to keep everyone happy, I will use what the general consensus seems to be. And that's a tolerance of 2.0, shadow relaxation of 6.0, and then go ahead and change the default sample radius anywhere from like 50 to 150. You can do generate here and that'll create an, a grid across all the rows. I like to just go in and put them manually because you want to avoid any nebula like I have here on the bottom and you want to avoid any big stars. So I use this box right here to make sure that the stars are as minimal as possible. And um, this is a pretty starry image, so it's tough. And that way I'm not eliminating anything that I actually want to keep. So moving along, uh, next we'll do blur exterminator. You can use whatever settings you want. Some stock settings are pretty good. I did do the sharpen stars at 25 because this was a starry image and that'll help reduce the stars and also sharpen the nebulosity. After that, I run a noise exterminator and what that's gonna do is all these little fuzzies you see here on the image, that will get rid of them. Again, this is to your taste. I tend, I tend to do somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 for me, that usually works good and I leave detail at 15. I've played around with it a lot over the last few weeks and all of these steps, by the way. And so I'll let you know when I think there's something that makes a difference, but otherwise I tend to leave some of those settings pretty close to stock. And then what I do here is a little bit different than you might be doing. I actually do a channel combination. So you go to process channel combination. And then for R, I put the S2 channel. For green, I do HA. And for blue, I do O3, just your standard SHO. If that's the palette you wanna do, match the palette you wanna do. So if you wanna do SHO or HOO, I do a channel combination. It gave me this image here. And then I do the star exterminator to that image to get the stars. And then I go ahead and I just throw this out. So I'm, I'm combining them early on just to remove the stars. And the reason I do that is because we're gonna actually stretch each channel individually in GHS rather than stretching them all together. And before we do that, I do wanna get a three color combination star. So I, do, I go ahead and do the color combined. Now I have color stars, they're not stretched, but I can set those off to the side. So we're still linear as you can see by by the blue arrows. Then I go into GHS and I have an entire video on that um, and I do each one individually. That way I can control. The big thing is I try to match up the lows and the highs. So like an area here in the background, if it's let's say 0.15 when I click or hover over it, I try to make sure that as I'm stretching the background and all of them are like 0.15. And then I'll go to the brightest point and let's say it's 0.7, I'll try to match that as well. Now sometimes with like HA is gonna be a lot stronger stronger in this case than the S2. So you might not match the highs all the way. 
But when I do this, I avoid the need really for linear fit. Linear fit doesn't really help a lot of my images because I'm stretching them individually. And as long as I do this, I tend to get um, really good results doing it that way. So it allows me to skip that step. After I do GHS, we are already ready for the color combination. Um, in this case, sorry, I did leave the stars in, but this is the pixel math formula I use um, for four x and I get that kind of cool orange and teal red look. And then below that, we have the traditional SHO uh, color combination, which gives you that kind of blue green look that we're all pretty familiar with. And as you can see, I just did that same channel combination method with the SHO. You can also use pixel math and put SHO in the RGB. They both do the same thing. So then what I do is I come over and we have the question of to SCNR or not to SCNR. This is an optional step. What I have found, as you can see, um, on this top set of data here, I just ran SCNR and then did curves. And as you can see, it's okay. On the bottom one though, I went ahead and I'll zoom in one more. On the bottom one, I did curves first, and it's this curve right here, and then I did SCNR, and I felt like I was able to get more color and a better look here than I do up here. Now, what I'm trying to do in this process is, as you can see with the green, I'm boosting up the um, reds and blues, and then I'm decreasing the green where I don't want it, but allowing it to be in some of the image. I also go into the hue and try to use the hue with the green and push some of it into the blue and some of it into the yellow. That way I'm getting more out of that green signal before I use SCNR and just eliminate it. You can also use SCNR to lower percentage, like 50, 75, 25, whatever you want. But I did end up doing 100% SCNR um, to get this down here. Um, the next step you can do is a color calibration. Um, you can use SPCC, you can use basic color calibration. Um, I don't find that this does a huge correction for me, even on the stars in a lot of cases, so I put it as optional. Um, with SPCC, obviously you're gonna have to do image solver and then go that way. With color calibration, if you wanna keep it simple, you're just gonna do a preview of a bright area, like the core here of this Rosette Nebula, and then one of the background. And then you're going to put the bright area up here in white reference, the background in the background reference, and then it will correct the colors for you and specifically the stars to make sure you're accurate. When it comes to narrow band imaging, I've done SPCC a bunch of times and zoomed in at like 300% side by side. I cannot see any visible difference 90% of the time. So you might get something different. I don't want to preclude you from doing that. I'm just saying for me to take the time to do the image analysis and to have it do it, it doesn't pay off a lot in the long run, but go ahead and experiment with that yourself. Now what I'm gonna do is stretch the star layer. So I'm gonna go into GHS again, and that star layer that we pulled off um, earlier in the process, we now need to stretch that to make it non-linear. And then I add it using Bill Blanchin and the guys over at another Astro's new script the screen stars, and I have a whole video on screen stars and their star reduction script, so go ahead and check that out. I'll put the link in the description. Um, and I like this because it's a cleaner way to do it, and it seems to retain more of the color, especially with one-shot color or RGB stars. And what you basically do is you take this star image on the right and then the starless image on the left. You do star replacement. Um, the starless view is this image 37, which has um, the wizard nebula but no star. On the right hand side, it has those stars that we pulled off and just stretched in the previous one. I put that in star view, create new image, and then you can title it whatever you want. And then I run their other new script, star reduction. What I like about this is there are so many different options compared to the other ways of star reduction. You can uh, choose between several different settings and you can even choose between three different levels of strength within the setting. And so that makes that a really valuable tool and it's a little bit more customizable even than Blur Exterminator. So this allows you to go lighter with the star reduction um, in Blur Exterminator if you want, especially since we're pulling those stars off. And then you can customize it a little bit more at this time um, and have a little bit more say so in how the stars are reduced. So again, check out those videos if you want more detail on that. 
And then the last thing that I do is I go into Photoshop and I do um, all the final touches to get an image, um, something like this. Uh, I probably needed a little bit more data, so I did push this one a little bit, but I was still pretty happy with the overall color palette. And then recently I just did the elephant trunk, so I'll overlay that as well. But again, there really is no right or wrong way to do this, but I, I know there's a lot of frustration out there and I know a lot of people are even avoiding making the switch to monochrome because they're afraid of the processing and it can be daunting. I've been there, I totally get it. So I wanted to come out with a guide to kind of simplify it for you guys. Hopefully this helps. Put any questions or comments below and clear skies.